when you serve 40,000 meals a year to the homeless folks in your community, you cross paths with some very interesting people. Today, we're sharing one of those people with you on the Street Life Ministries podcast. Hi, everybody. I'm here with my friend Floyd um, for our another podcast. And I've known Floyd for about nine years um, here in Redwood City. Uh, homeless, now not homeless. And so we're here to kind of just talk about what, it's, what uh, my friend Floyd's experience has been like um, for the last several years since I've known him and maybe even a little bit before. Um, this podcast is probably going to be one of the most personal and deepest ones I've done so far. Um, but it's for folks who listen to this podcast and actually see this news feed. Um, I really want our folks to kind of get an understanding um, from somebody who's been there, done it, kind of experienced it. Um, and maybe uh, shed some light on what people may think or what their reserves are with people who have lived on the street. So I think I met you um, early around 2008, 2009, when I barely started uh, looking to start Street Life Ministries in Redwood City. Hmm. And you were over there on the other side of... Um, 101 over there by the pg e power plant area mm-hmm. underneath 101 in a, in a living in an RV mm-hmm. and um, I would have to say that out of all the folks that I met you were the probably the nicest guy I'd met um, that far you were warm you were welcoming um, you had your dog Rita who um, did not want to leave me alone notice that Rita didn't want to leave anybody alone um, <laughs> but no but I mean to be honest with you I I I, I got to know you um, on a, a little bit more of a personal level, and then um, and then you kind of uh, helped me. Uh, actually, kind of gave me some guidance on how to work on the streets. And so I, I'm grateful uh, for you, Floyd, for the times and stuff that I've come to you, and you've kind of given me the places where I should and shouldn't go on the street, who I should and shouldn't talk to, and um, and that helped me out a lot and helped me get gain some experience on the street. Because as you know, you. You've been living on the streets for a while and um, kind of know the ins and outs, right? So, um, well, I guess, I guess, I guess, my question is: Is uh, were you where were you were you born and raised here in Redwood City? South San Francisco. South San Francisco. Okay. Thirty-seven years. Thirty-seven years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then, when did you end up coming to Redwood City? Uh, that would have been, oh, geez. Of 2003, maybe? 2003? Yeah, somewhere okay. in there. Okay. 2003, yeah. Actually, I probably made it into San Francisco in a motor home and then down into Redwood City. Um, 2003 to 2005, somewhere in there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. My, so I, I have, I have my what's known as. 2003, so yeah. I'm surprised we didn't run into each other when I was in my addiction, but. We might have, but we didn't even know it. Yeah, yeah. It's been uh, it's been quite an adventure. Yeah, it sure has, huh? Mm-hmm. So, how long? How many years would you say you were living on the streets? Mm, twenty. Twenty years. Yeah. Yeah. So you've learned a lot to living in twenty years, huh? Yeah. No. Yeah. Come across a lot of people in twenty years, I'm sure. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> been uh, at times like a tightrope walk. Yeah. And then at times, you know, you're on top of the world. Yeah. I'd have to say since I've known you, I've, I've walked alongside of you in, in some of the good and some of the bad. And mm-hmm. I've definitely seen the ups and the downs of homelessness mm-hmm. through you um, since I've been able to stay connected to you the most out of anybody on the street. I, most of the people I work with on the street, they, they tend to go through their moments where they kind of dodge me or, or don't want to have anything to do with me, but no, I've had that exact experience. Absolutely. <laughs> but you've always been someone I can always approach. If I know where you're parked at or where you were staying at for a while it was Denny's, um, on Woodside and Broadway and that it was the power plant. And no, we're going to go back further now to Jessica. We're going to go back to Kmart lot, Kmart lot. but I literally, Jessica. I literally lived there for two years Yeah, and right. the stories, you know, are just, amazing like for me to tell these two things that i've been through it's very very hard to believe yeah yeah 
Um, is there any is there any kind of those things that you could share that would that would kind of give a, like a more of an idea for folks to understand? I mean, well, I don't want to go off on any tangents, so you have to lead the way. All I can do is talk to you. <laughs> okay. Um, what would you say, um, respectively speaking, what would you say some of the craziest things you've seen on, on the street? Well, for example, one night, you remember Glenda, the girl, the Indian girl? She had a sister. She drove a truck around yellow with yeah. flames on the side. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one night I get a knock at my door and I wake up and it's police and lots of ambulance and fire department and police and they, they start to tell me about a girl that um, says I threw her out my door and they got her on a stretcher and her head is wrapped up and split her melon wide open. And I don't know really anything about this. I know that I had a dream that somebody attacked me, right? Mm -hmm. And then the police officer said, we know that you're telling us the truth because the girl said she came here and opened your door and went in because I was drunk, passed out. She walked, went into your home because you had left your bicycle in back of her pickup truck and she couldn't go to sleep because she slept in the back of the pickup because my bike was in there. Yeah. So she had come in and grabbed a hold of me and my reaction was, and I didn't even really realize that it had happened. And in reality, I could have been in deep, deep trouble. Right. But the officer knew that I was telling the truth. That's good. That's yeah. really good. Wow. And, and since she's passed, you know, and she was coming around for a long time. I had to take the stitches out of her head. Oh she, she wouldn't go back to get the staples pulled out. I pulled them out for her about wow. six, eight weeks later. Wow. She died shortly after that. Did she? Yeah. So COPD. COPD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you seen a lot of people? Kind of, you've, you have probably seen a lot I've of I've seen a lot of people die. I came one morning. I uh, was going through uh big lots mm -hmm. remember big lots over there yeah. and i seen that girl uh i'm trying to remember her name um she lived in a band they called her the cat woman she oh, was a I blonde yes, I know who you're talking about. and i saw her on the ground and she was flopping around and i kind of went by you know my wheel you shouldn't be passing people laying down with your wheel that close to them. Mm -hmm. And she was still moving. And I guess uh, she was in the process of dying right there. That's, she, yeah. When I passed by her at 6 in the morning, she was still alive. Within yeah. a few hours, she was dead. And she used to stay over there on Spring Street, Spring in uh, uh, Chestnut. Yeah, she, she was around. Um, my initial, initially, when I met her, that was on Kmart lot, and I forget what it was about. Oh, uh, when you live on the street, you know, uh, you have the bathroom issues, of course, mm -hmm. right? Sure. sure. Right. Uh, like, for example, a friend of mine, he uses, we call him gas can Gary. He uses a gas can he used. And so um, if people, you know, you had an argument or something or you wanted to get somebody's butt, you take that can after it sits for several weeks and you go pour it underneath their RV and it's absolutely horrible. <laughs> so she came over and she was upset about people urinating in the bushes because when the wind would come up, the, the lot would smell like urine. Right. And so uh, we, her and I started to exchange words and I, I said to her, you know, if you were, you're not a man, so don't come and talk to me like a man. But I said, if you were a man, you would have punched me by now. And man, she spun around so fast and laid me right out, that girl. Really? Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, split my split my uh, lip wide open, you know, stitches underneath and shit. Yeah. And, you know, the police, they, uh, at, at that time, for where, whatever reason. Yeah. Yeah. I, maybe I, I deserved it. You know, my reaction, though, when she hit me was, you know, I was going to beat the dog snot out of her. And I, I just gathered enough just not to, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I've never hit a woman in my life, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's pretty tough when you're... 
Well, it's pretty tough to, to live the life sure. I've lived yeah. and be able to say that at my age. That's amazing. Sure. sure. Right? Wow. So take, take me through some of your your journey right now. So you, uh, you I know you and Jessica were uh, living on the street uh, over at Kmart. And then mm-hmm. um, I know uh, her and Ryan ended up getting together. And then you uh, were, were alone for a little while. Well, the there's quite a story there. Uh, of course, you know, Jessica and I had got involved with your ministry. Yes. And I think I had a, we had about five years you know, yeah. per clean, basically. Um, boy, I'll tell you, that's a tough road there, too. And, I, and I'm trying not to go off on tangents because, right. you know, it was, okay. this could take hours. But yeah. um, I noticed that uh, Jessica, there had been, well, we'd be attending street church, and I kept noticing this fella who seemed to be staring at us. Mm-hmm. And I could feel that something was going on with these two, right? Sure. Sure. So I thought, well, this is pretty simple. If, if she's got an affair going on, all I need to do is piss her off to give her an out, and I'll know. Mm-hmm. So at street church, uh, at the end of uh, the service, I stood up and I, I left. She didn't know I left. And man, it pissed her off. She let me know, right? What I'd already known anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the next thing I know, my son comes down from to visit me out of Oregon. He's still a little boy. So, God, he would have been, what, about back then? About 11, 12 or something. Uh, knock, knock at the door. It's Kevin Valley, and he's got a uh, subpoena for me or uh, a stay-away order. Uh-huh. And so... Her boyfriend had it, had kind of made up a story, mm. but the bizarre thing was was that they never made a police report. So you know, I didn't go to court. You know, guy wanted me to respond. And I said, no, I'm not going to lend credence to this thing. Sure. It's already bad enough. And I mean, I was pretty pissed off about that for a long time. You know. Uh, my words behind your back probably wouldn't be the same as they were to your face, for sure. Sure, sure. And uh, um, the same way, right, that everything, just the truth, the truth got me out of that thing, Mm -hmm. right? But it took over a year. Street Life Ministries is able to serve 40,000 meals and help around 20 people permanently get off the streets every year because of our amazing volunteers and donors. And these numbers are great, but we feel God is calling us to do more. In one year, we want to double these numbers, and if we get enough donations, we can make it happen. So, if you are not a monthly donor yet, maybe now is the time to start. It feels pretty great being a part of of this powerful movement. Just go to streetlifeministries.org and click donate. Again, that is streetlifeministries.org and you click donate. Now let's get back to the show. Well, I would, since I've gotten to know you, I would would say that you're, um, how do I say this? You're a pretty smart guy. I mean, you've got, you've got, you've got your instincts. I mean, you've been on the street around a lot of different people for the last 20 years and you've got some pretty good intuition oh. and instincts to know when somebody's doing you wrong um, pretty pretty quickly right off the bat or, or if they're, or if they're good, right? If, you know, friend or foe, right? I think you've been able to hone in on that fairly well, don't you think? There's a bird that sits on my shoulder yeah. and the little bird, when I'm living right and doing what the spirit what I'm expected to do, mm-hmm. you cannot lie to me. Yeah. No. Interesting. No. Yeah. And I never get convicted of anything when, when I tell the truth. Sure. Always. No matter what the Democrats do. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. They're, our society is moving towards the truth. They're trying to move. The truth is what we know truth as. Mm-hmm. It's what data says. Right? Sure. 
artificial intelligence has taken over. Interesting. More, a lot stronger than people even begin to understand or realize or yeah. want to realize. So, say you, um, so you move forward a couple years, and then I know um, somewhere in the in all of the midst of that, I know uh, you were working for Guy Montero, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. For a while, we got you hooked up with that, and then um, then there was a, a little spell there, and then. Um, I can't remember how long in between working with Guy and uh, you living over at the at the power power plant area. Uh, I don't know what it is. It's not a power plant, but it's like a power transfer station. Anyway, but uh, I know you were living in an RV over there for a little while. But somewhere in between there, um, something had happened where I I started to notice that you were picking up more of a spiritual uh -oh. sense, right? And I don't know if you had already known well, God for a while or if it was something that had. We go back to Guy Montoro, you, you know, your ministry and through you, I met Guy. You, right. you set that up, your ministry. Yeah. Um, and I remember sitting down with Guy when you, had, when you uh, first opened up over there behind 7-Eleven. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Mr. Montoro said to me, so tell me, what do you do? And I, I went ahead and told him. And... Come to find out, he told me later on after that, you know, that um, he nearly fell off the stool. He was sitting on because, um, well, for me to be honest here, is everybody's going to know exactly who I am, so there's no point in uh, <laughs> Floyd's my middle name. Anyways, uh, I was a house mover, mm -hmm. you know. I was fortunate enough to, in seventh grade, the summer, uh, I, I got a job mm -hmm. working with this house mover, and it was uh, the most torturous, brutal stuff you could imagine. I mean, I hated it. I absolutely hated it. But I did it and managed to do it in seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, and right on through high school, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And long story, um, the man, my first day on the job, he had these 96 foot long steel beams and he's got this old, uh, what was it? Uh, I believe it was a, uh, he called it old yellow, right? Mm -hmm. And it was an old truck. Uh, I think it was a white or something. It had a fixed A-frame boom on it with a winch and, and the boom was curved. It, it, it had been bent so bad, but so he's got these beams. There are, 100 feet long steel, and you pick them up in the center, and, and it acts like a teeter-totter. Mm -hmm. And a couple of men stay on one end of it, and he maneuvers the, the truck, and you got to, you swing the boom around according to where you, what you're doing with it. And so me and my brother-in-law, uh, he's the one who brought me in, because uh, one of the trucks had broke a few day, uh, the day before, and they would intentionally break trucks. Mm. They would beat them real bad because you convoy when you go to a job. And so the truck breaks down, and now you're, they're sitting on the side of the road paid for the day, right? Oh, right. So they were pulling this crap. Mm -hmm. So anyways, he tells me to get on that beam. I'm only there a few minutes, and, and he picks it up. And I'm looking at this thing and I'm going, and, and this old man is hooping and hollering, that's what he called it, and he's screaming because there's a pickup truck out in the field uh, in the middle of this job site, and it wasn't supposed to be there because the beam had to go, go through there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he, they couldn't get the truck moved, so we went on ahead. So when the beam start, rocks one way, it's lifting both of us up off of our feet. It's that massive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said to him, I said, boy, look at that old truck and that. I said, that cable could snap. I said, you better keep your body clear of this thing, right? And then, so we started to swing the beam around and we got over the pickup. And my brother-in-law said to me, boy, wouldn't it be something if that cable snapped right now in the no more did the words get out of his mouth and the next thing I know, I'm on top of this beam. It literally cut the truck in half. Literally, right straight through it, right to the ground. Wow. 
the, the end of the beam had caught the corner of the truck, maybe say two or three feet of the back, starting with the camper and all the way right to the ground. And I landed on top of it. Wow. And the old man said, he turned around at that moment and he said, that guy is going to be a house mover. And that's the story he told. I had to hear him tell it for years to people, right? Sounds to me like you had an angel on your shoulder. <laughs> that, that's what it, I don't know about being a mover, but it, it oh, sure sounds like you had an angel on your I shoulder. I had gone oh. from that point, in, I had gone on the most fantastic, amazing adventure. So I've been really, really blessed. Thank God. Yeah. Thank God. And I acknowledge it, and I'm appreciative. Yeah, absolutely. I try to be. Right. But it's been a battle my whole life, you know? Sure, sure. Drug addiction. Yeah. So, yeah, let's, so let's, let's kind of talk about that for a little bit. So I know, I know um, one of your, your battles has been meth, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah, and nonstop. So, so talk about that a little bit. What, what's, what is, what, what's that like? I mean, I know. Oh, yeah, what's it like? I mean, oh. so I know, I know you wrestle with it. I, I, you and I have known each other for years. I've got, I'm, I've got 15 years in sobriety. Meth was my thing, uh, as well, but obviously not quite to the extent of what it's where, where it's at for you. But um, I'm here today, right now, and I'm clean. I'm clean. Yeah. I haven't had that in several years now. Yeah. Right. Uh, to tell you quite honestly, I'll tell you the exact truth is I was listening to Jimmy Swagger three nights ago and uh, it was an, uh, a repeat of, of something where he saved uh, building a few hundred thousand people in there right. and uh, he saved a lot of people and he said you too right yeah. so I sat down dropped on my knees and I I repeated what he said with my mouth. Yeah. I could not stop. Mm. And I stopped. Wow. I feel like I've been born again. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I've been so close to death. You know, yeah. I have been having these, the, the things that I share with Jamie, but my experiences, I, I don't really share with anybody because I don't trust them. Sure. You mean your deep, darkest stuff, right? It's not the deep, darkest stuff. It's but, the yeah, spiritual, yeah. the things that God's been showing me. Right. Yeah, we've talked about that a little bit. Yeah. You know, so... um so I know this is kind of going past speeding up a little bit, but like, so you and Jamie, your, your girlfriend, um, who, who I know you guys are, are like, just kind of just really, really close to each other and help each other out in a lot of ways. We were just talking about that before we started that she has been diagnosed with diabetes and I know you've been battling some cancer, right? Uh, yes. Some cancer. So, and I, and I know that you guys have, uh, through these battles, you guys have, um, really formed a, a real serious bond. And um, in the last, I don't know, how, how many months has it been that you guys have been housed now? Six months. Six months. Mm -hmm. You know, which is kind of interesting how, in, in some ways I find it really kind of uncanny how God housed you and Jamie in an apartment complex, like literally right next to the ministry, um, which is kind of a God thing, I think. It's, it's, oh, it's kind, kind of? <laughs> if, if, if. If I wasn't going off on tangents, we were I would, we were getting to Montoro, yeah. Guy Montoro. Yeah. So I went to work for Guy Montoro because when he nearly fell off his stool, he had a house in his backyard that him and his wife didn't know what they were going to do with. It was on the ground. It was rotten. It was infested with uh, uh, wild animals, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a pretty bad situation. And so he said, you can you jack this thing up, and I said, absolutely I can. That's what I do. Yeah. Well, I went to work for him for a few years. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah, and then uh, I was doing really well, and 
Well, it seemed to me one day my son was coming again and a guy said to me, you know, that he wanted to send me on a vacation. And um, it was uh, just shortly after that that I had relapsed yeah. before I actually went on this. And um, what I learned from it in the end, because uh, it broke up our relationship. Right. And, um, uh, but, you know, what I learned was that don't ever go on a vacation unless you save the money yourself. You worked hard. You were disciplined enough to save that money to take yourself on a vacation. Yeah. But as a man, don't accept a vacation as a gift from another man. That was a mistake. Mm. It was a big mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, um, but, you know, if I could go back and do these things, I wouldn't dare. Would I be here if I did? Right. I don't. You know. I don't know. But well, I think I think our paths are these these amazing little paths or journeys, right? And so each we have these different chapters in our lives, and you've you've definitely filled several chapters of of, of <laughs> some pretty exciting, oh. some pretty exciting things. But um, I, I I say I mean I say this with all honesty. I mean I've I've enjoyed getting to know you. Over the years, I've gotten to know you, and I, I've I've cried for you, I've prayed for you, I've prayed with you, I've I've struggled uh, uh, with my friendship with you um, because um, I I think I struggle with, with my friendship with uh, several people on the street that I care about, but then I see them stuck in addiction, and I see them stuck in sometimes pride or stubbornness or whatever, and I and I and I know they're on their bottom, but they don't want. I just it's not that they, I don't think that they want like don't want to get help, but I think that it's just sometimes we, the help is so close to us, but we don't know how to accept it. And so there's been moments where I've, I've seen you. Um, Seven deadly sins. Yeah. Right. You they know? got the. Yeah. And there were some times where I just like, you know, there was times where I would get phone calls from um, Redwood City police officers and other, and other agencies that knew that I knew you and they were like, can you just go talk to Dom? Can you just go over to Woodside and Denny's and talk to him? And I remember there was a time a couple of years ago when, uh, when Rita had a litter of puppies and there was a bunch of puppies over there. And, uh, oh, I would take all those puppies out and panhandle. I know. Man, was I making a fortune. I know. But unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, what was it all, right? Yeah. I was, yeah. I'm serving the wrong guy. Right? Well, it was so funny because out of one of, out of that litter, you ended up uh, giving Jamie Dozer, and then we ended up with Dozer. Oh and yeah. Then Jamie, then yeah. Jamie ended up getting pregnant, and and w she had nowhere to take put Dozer, so Dozer went and lived with my wife and I when we first got married. And I've never in my entire life have had a seven month, eight month old, eighty five pound dog dog <laughs> in my home before, and unfixed and. And that was for my family. We loved the dog, but that was a lot of dog. And oh, we a, and we were yeah. not ready for it. that dog. Literally, could I remember my son when I first got married to uh, my wife? He was uh, six, and we were uh, playing with the dog. And he asked if we could walk Dozer, and I and I said, "Listen, I go, I'm gonna hold the leash while you hold the leash." And that dog. The strength that that animal had. If it wanted to run, it would have literally just picked my six-year-old kid up and flapped him like like he was a piece of paper down the street. It was incredible that dog. To partner with that dog for life yeah. would bring you to a whole different level. Yeah. 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 Oh, it was a very. You know what's interesting is is I noticed really fast with that dog because it was pit, and I noticed mm -hmm. with that dog that um, it takes on this interesting little dynamic in the home it loved my wife it loved my son it loved me it knew where the food came from it knew where the who plays with it it knew mm -hmm. it knew that um but when the, when we would take the dog for walks um outside it it had this alpha male role that it would that it would like i was the alpha male in the house mm -hmm. and then when we'd go outside he would want to be the alpha male because he was protecting my family and i just noticed it was just really it, it was a very interesting experience, to say the least, with that dog. <laughs> but, I, um, I admire them when you observe them because um, um, I would say that the, the animals, the dogs, are exactly as we are to God. 
-hmm. right? Sure. He, we're just, their love and loyalty is just, it, there's no end. There's no, right. it is absolute love. Yeah, and like they the, will give the their life your, for you in the blink of an eye. What's the name of your German Shepherd you have now? Ace. Ace. And I notice how Ace walks, like, will not leave you or Jamie's side. Like, he, he goes where you are, wherever you're at. We don't know where he came from. But Ace is role. He was sent to to us by God. Yeah. He sure was, and uh, he's the most amazing animal that I've ever experienced. Yeah. So as we as we kind of finish this up, um, what 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 has housing been like for you after twenty years of living on the streets and now housed? I know I know it was a little bit of a struggle at first. Living on the street, if you don't have a functioning, if you don't have your facilities functioning in your RV, um, you've got about a two-minute window, right? Especially if you get sick, like I, like I have been. Sure. So you're dealing with that constantly. Um, you start accepting things as being normal that are far from the normal. I mean, I was talking to the police literally every single day. Right. That is not normal. I had, I had accepted that as normal. Mm -hmm. And I had gone to uh, Oregon, you know, to see my son up there. And when I got up there, I started to realize, because it was no longer happening to me up there, they're probably happening to everybody now, but... And so that's one thing, and then and and then another thing is um, hygiene, you know, especially if you're you're you take an ad addiction, add meth into that mm -hmm. equation, pretty soon your quality of life starts to just slip, sure. right? You may not only bathe once a month, yeah, if even that, right? And uh, you start accepting that as the norm, and it's not. And, and would you can would you think? Because I know for me, part of my um, when I got when I first got clean and sober, I didn't realize how I wasn't just addicted to the meth, but I was also addicted to the drama. Oh, oh, oh! The drama, the, the drama becomes a normal too, doesn't it? Another thing that really ha does happen to you is that you know you may spend a lot of time in the driver's seat, not driving, just passing time. Well, we get addicted to the movement around us seeing everything the cars the life every all of it we get addicted to it sure and you go inside those walls and you got an adjustment period right so would you say the first couple months when you and Jamie went inside it was kind of no oh, yeah it was quite bizarre <laughs> yeah I know um it was really interesting the first person we got housed uh about five or six years ago um they lived underneath uh 101 right there by sports basement it was, mm -hmm. uh, it was Toys R Us at the time, but when we got that person housed, he he said to uh, myself and the and the Life Moves caseworker at the time, he says that it's it's too quiet. He had gotten so used to hearing the thump of the cars go across that you know where the mm -hmm. there's a skip between the asphalt and mm -hmm. the concrete and you hear that da -dit, da -dit, da -dit. he had gotten so used to that that humming sound that when he went into his apartment. He got scared at night because it was just so quiet. And yeah, didn't know what to do. So mm -hmm. he actually uh, spent the night out underneath that overpass a couple nights a week, and then a couple nights in the apartment until he could get used to the wow quietness. Which, um, hey, everybody's different. Everybody's got to figure out how to adjust. But I, I, you know, I guess from my my perspective, I guess you know, and I guess this is something that other people might think of. As soon as you get housing, you think. Oh my gosh! Let me just run into housing. I, I I can't wait, right? But then, but you got to remember, it's 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 such a change, right? It's mm. it's a scary change because it's something all new. I mean, you got plumbing. You know, you talk about taking a shower once a month. Now you got a shower. You can take a shower anytime you want. Yeah, uh, the cooking, right? Cooking. I had I had adjusted to not eating, and I've got this cancer. This and you know I malnutrition, mm -hmm. but I'm I'm not getting the food, right? So I had done that. I had, I had disciplined myself as being a house mover, be, being able to work long hours with little food. Yeah. And man, after years of it, it pretty soon it's normal to me, but not to anybody else. Right. Right. right? Well, it's, it's, it's funny you said that. So I spent 20 something years as a truck driver 
And uh, I used to always get up at 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning to go to work. I'd mm-hmm. start work at like 5, 30, 6 o'clock every day. And I did that for so long that even today, I, I'm, I'm, I, my body, I, I'm awake at 4.30 with no alarm no matter what. It's mm-hmm. just kind of in my, in my, it actually, today it works for my benefit because I get up early, I have time with God and, and I do, I have a little workout in my house, so I work out and stuff like that. So it works, it works in my favor now, but when I first got sober and, and I didn't know how to, it was hard for me, I didn't know how to adjust. I also <laughs> spent a lot of times in my addiction where I was spending all night up and then sleeping Three or four days later, I would spend sleep for twelve hours or fourteen hours straight, and then I'd wake up and get high right away. But hey, you know that's another another story. Yeah, me. well, I did that for thirty years, you know. So yeah, there's no more. It's uh, um, I've been really blessed, and I'm I'm really thankful to God. I'm thankful that He's right there for me and always, and uh, I ignore Him. You know, when I'm in a, in my addiction, I ignore. Um, some people I, I like to call the little bird that, that lives on my shoulder. Sure, yeah. You know, and but you know, I'm really happy right at this moment in time, and that um, I'm building my relationship back up. Yeah. Would you say? God. Would you say this is probably the most peaceful time that you've ever had in your life? Absolutely, absolutely. I I worry about you know when this happens that. When I go clean, I always worry about tomorrow. I always worry about the next hour. Yeah. It's not day to day for me. It's minute to minute. Yeah. But I have so much vivid before me truth. I know so much truth that I don't want to. Mm-hmm. It is in my heart that I'm to be on the right path. It is in my heart to show who I am, to be who I am. Right. Not not this screwed up crap that I've experienced. I'm I'm grateful, you know, I wouldn't go back. Yeah. But but now every minute has to count now. Sure. sure. I don't have the slack to play anymore. To right. Would you say would you say with your cancer and um and having to look at that, what it could, what it could ultimately lead to, does it give you a different perspective on life? Totally different perspective. Yeah. You know, I'm on my knees asking God for more time. Right. And He tells me all the time, "I will restore you to exactly the man that you were supposed to be or want to be. He'll heal me." Sure. But I have to, I have to walk the walk, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and uh, it's amazing, you know, because we get, there's, for me, there's days like when I see the truth, Mm -hmm. right? Sure. And, but the darn, you got to go to sleep, you know, and you got to wake up and and stay in there is is the trick, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So 20 years living on the street. Now you got six months in an apartment. You have a, a, a lovely girlfriend that you are not just boyfriend, girlfriend, but you guys are solid. I mean, you're like a team. Yeah. You know, which is nice. It's, it's awesome. You know, I'm worried about her too. You know, her health too. Right. But a lot of times I notice she's kind of like, um, geez, how would you say? I guess maybe all women would be like this. But if I... If I'm feeling a way, she feels the same way. Yeah. So it's like, I don't. I mean, well, you know, it's I, very, it's very, you know, it's interesting you said that. So, uh, I, I don't, I think it's very biblical. So God, God in the Bible calls the husband, the the man in the home, to be a leader. And I've noticed that when when I'm at home with my wife, um, she just naturally will follow my lead. Um, yeah. So if I'm in a good mood, she she's relatively in a good mood. If if I if I'm feeling ill, she she tends to not feel ill, but she there's a side of her that kind of changes, and um and I've noticed I've noticed that that also happens in the opposite direction too with her. Like if I come home, and she's not feeling well, you know you it, it's interesting. You know when you're when you're with somebody long enough, you start taking on their their characteristics in, in weird ways, right? Mm. Um, 
But I will say that the other thing too, and I've noticed this with, with Jamie and you, is that um, with my wife and I, Sean, is that um, there's, there's certain areas of my life where um, I'm affected like emotionally or you know, like where I get sad or depressed or whatever. Or, and, and my wife seems to be the only one that knows how to come around me and, and say certain things to me that takes me out of it, right? And, um, and so I've noticed that with, with you and Jamie. I've noticed that like there's been times where I've seen you guys kind of like in a, where you're struggling or you're not feeling good and we've talked and I've noticed that you guys can talk to each other in that same way that my wife and I do, where we just know our, our spouses. We just know them in a way where we can kind of bring them out of that, that situation. And so I think it's a good thing. Right? She doesn't seem to do it with words. I mean, um, I try to get them out of her, but no, she just has that way about her that, sure. uh, that's a good I, thing. Yeah, that's, it that's, is. That's because you're loved. Yeah. So, um, like I was saying, uh, so 20 years on the street, seeing the things that you've seen, the experiences that you've gone through, and now six months housed with, with your, your girlfriend, Jamie, um, taking care of each other, loving each other. I know you, you've got a, a, an awesome skill with working on cars. I know you try your best to fix cars and... Well, I mean, I think it's good. I think one of the things you do is, is you, you stay busy. I'm getting it together now because one thing when you're addicted, you can't get organized for nothing. You know, I was, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I laugh when you say that because I was notorious for uh, getting high and I took everything apart, but I never could put it back together. My high would always wear out by the time I got done taking it It's just apart. a different version of that, right? Yeah. I mean... Okay, so you're past that. You know how to put things back together. But no, you still are facing the same crap. Oh, yeah. That, right? You only think you're putting it together. <laughs> what if I'm fixing shit that was never broke? <laughs> well, that was my thing. <laughs> my computers were, were making noises that I thought they were making that they weren't making. And I take them apart to figure out why it's making the noise. But then I had so much static electricity on my fingers, I just fried everything. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It's horrible. But so what would you say, you know, just for, for people that are going to listen to this podcast and, and uh, they want to pray for you. Obviously we want to pray for for you with your cancer and Jamie with your diabetes, but you know, 20, I just think to myself, listening to you and your story, I, I think of, of the fact that what a miracle for one, but I think the other thing is too, is I want people to take away from this is uh, never, never, never look at somebody that's been homeless for a long time and give them prejudgment that they'll never get it together. Because after 20 years, here you are. You're housed and you're doing really well. I mean, I know it was I know it was rough the first couple months reacclimating from outdoors to indoors, but I mean, you're doing relatively well. I mean, before we start... I'm, I'm, con I'm concerned. You know, I, I want to go... I'm just concerned and, I, and I'm just... I have to just give it to God. Yeah. I mean... I really genuinely have to give it to him. Yeah. I have to count on him yeah. to, to make me right. And do you, would you say, do you have a, do you have a, a, a good relationship with Jesus Christ today? Yes, I do. Yeah. That's awesome. Yes, I do. That's awesome. And it's only going to get better. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, God is, uh, I'm, I'm glad for forgiveness. Because yeah. without that, we none of us. Yeah. Where would we be? Well, Don, I, I, I just want to say thank you for being here, taking taking your time to come over here and, and doing this with me. And I, I'm just grateful to call you a friend. Oh, thank you, know, you David. I, I love having you in my life.